subject of striving for mastery. Striving for mastery. Uh, let me quickly say this in a nutshell. The message is going to be talking about you being your best in everything. Being nothing but your best in everything. I look at the book of First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Here the Bible is telling us that the athletes of the world and all that people that compete for one thing or the other, those into the football, those into soccer, those that are running, they are all competing for mastery. And yet, in order to be able to win, they are disciplined. They are temperate. It's not everything that everybody does that they do. It's not every food that everybody eats that they eat. It's not the way other people sleep that they sleep. Whether it is raining, cold, or sunning, they are out there practicing. And so, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. And understand, they are doing those things to get a temporary earthly reward, recognition, and glory, which are corruptible. But we, our labor, our service, our devotion, our commitment to the Lord is for an incorruptible glory. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And if a man strive for masteries, yet he see not crown except he strive lawfully. Now, we see another version of this. The word of God still presented to us this issue of mastery. That in order to be able to be your best, in order to be able to win the crown, in order to be able to get the award, the trophy, you don't get it until you effectively strive lawfully. That means there are rules of the game and there are rules of this Christian journey. There are conditions, there are instructions and directions that we must follow in order to be able to strive lawfully it's not enough to come to church it's not enough to be called by the name of a christian it's not enough to come from a christian family it's not enough for you to be able to sing in the church it's not enough for you to be able to have title in the church you if you're going to make it to heaven if i'm going to make it to heaven we must strive lawfully to have mastery is to have control or superiority over someone or something. It also stands, mastery stands, for comprehensive knowledge or skill in a subject or accomplishment. God expects us as believers to have mastery over our Christian life and become a fruitful, uh, a fruitful bearing tree and uh, our a fruit bearing tree the lord will help us in jesus name come back again to that first corinthians let's take it now from verse 24 through to 26. know ye not that they which run in a race now i tell you whether soccer whether you're into basketball whether you are a runner an athlete whatever you do know ye not that they which run in a race run all run all not that they run part of it not that they run a segment of it no they run all but one receiveth the prize so run that ye may obtain and every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain 
a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, personalize it. I therefore so run. Can somebody say that? Not as uncertainly. Continue. So fight I. Not as one that beateth the air. So here we see the Apostle Paul comparing this glorious eternal mastery with running and with fighting. And he's making us to know that we must be certain, we must be sure, we must be definite about what we are doing. The race we are running, the journey we are into. And so, you don't want to live your life like that person there, that person there, that person there. You want to be focused on heaven, and heaven will be prepared for you in Jesus' name. And you don't want to fight like the one beating the air. I have seen some people, of course, they are not practicing to fight, but just running. And then they will be boxing like this on the road, beating the air. If you really want to practice a fight, you go somewhere and then you are really punching something. Paul said, I fight not as one that is beating the air. The word strife is a language of battle. It means to struggle, to fight, to make serious attempt, to endeavor, to contend, to contend, and make a deliberate effort with a focused determination on a goal. Focused determination. Not just that you don't know where you are going. If you don't know where you are going, you will end up just anywhere. But you know your goal. You know your target. And then you are focused on that thing. Yes, there may be some noise on this side, some noise on the other side, some things happening behind. You are focused. And then you keep on going. You keep on going. You keep on going. When you see the athletes, when they are running, they don't care about their father, their mother, brother, sister, or what's all going on around them. They are focused. They don't care about any other thing. They are looking at the goal. They want to win that race. Those playing soccer, the same way, the same thing. The Lord will help us to be focused to the end in Jesus' name. Every believer is expected to strive to win and receive an incorruptible crown. Mastery is something that we have to do on a daily basis in order to be victorious in this Christian journey. Christian journey. You, you don't come to church or go to church because, well, uh, I love the people there. No. You go to church because you want the best for your soul. You want the best for your life. So, the Lord will give you the grace in Jesus' name. This mastery we're talking about is not going to be on a bed of roses. I understand. The Christianity today is not like it used to be. I understand that people want to live a carefree life this time and age. I understand that raising children, especially in this environment, can be tough and challenging. But I need to let you know that no matter the changes there, the changes there, the changes there, God has not changed. I need a better one. The word of God has not changed. The judgment of God has not changed. And so, if you really want to make it to heaven, you don't imitate people that are not serious. You don't follow after the pattern that are not determined to make it to heaven. You make up your mind that you will be that model of a believer 
example of a Christian in your disposition, in your character, in your behavior, in your attitude. Please get me right. Even in your dressing. And there may be some of you here that when you come to church, there is a way you look. When you go out there, there's another way you look. You are a flip-flopper. Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal and prophets of Ashtaroth and to Ahab the king, if God be God, serve him. And I challenge you. If God be God, serve him. I said serve him. And if you want to go back into the world, go back to the world. That we know you are in the world. You want to come to the Lord. When I gave my life to Christ, I burnt the bridge behind me. I said bye-bye to the world. I gave up a lot of things, not by any pressure from anybody. My father was not born again then. My mother was not born again then. I don't have any brother or sister to emulate, but the spirit of the living God possess me and I knew that without holiness no man shall see the Lord I was not even in deeper life so it's not about church I gave up a lot of things before I came to deeper life it's not about denomination if you really want to serve the Lord serve the Lord my colleagues at work they knew something had happened in my life the church I was going, they knew something had happened in my life. Can the world look at you and tell that of a truth? You have met with the Lord. Can the world look at you and tell that, uh, that of a truth? Sister, you are real and genuine. Brother, you are real and genuine. The Lord is calling somebody here today to strive for mastery. Strive to be on top. Strive to be above board. If you are interested in just enjoying the world, please pay attention here. You cannot be in the Lord and be in the world. A servant cannot serve two masters. The Lord is calling you to a life of commitment, a life of consecration, a life of dedication, and God will give you the grace in Jesus' name. And so, this mastery I'm talking about, this mastery the Word of God is talking about, is not on a bed of roses. It will take a real desire, desire, desire. It will take a, a firm decision. It will take a fearless determination. It will take a diligence in duty, diligence in duty. It will take disconnection from the world. Disconnection from the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, if any woman love the world, if any pastor love the world, if any girl loves the world, if any boy loves the world, if any worker, any member, anyone loves the world, the Bible says the love of the Father is not in him. And the world passeth away, and all the things that are there in But if you will love the Lord, if you fear the Lord, if you will serve the Lord, you will endure forever. And the Lord will keep you to the very end in Jesus' name. That means your devotion and loyalty will be to God and to God alone and that on a daily basis. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. I told you it's all about fight. It's all about struggle. It's all about contention. Chapter 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil doesn't want you to make it to, to heaven. But hear me, in the name of the Lord, you will make it to heaven. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, I have fought a good fight. And you see, it's a fight. It's a fight. It's a battle. Your loved ones, 
We do some things that if you don't have your mind made up, you will follow your friend, you will follow your brother, you will follow your sister, you will follow your father, you will follow your mother away from the Lord. And the devil will allow some things to happen that will drift you away from the faith, from the truth. I can tell you, innumerable number of people, that one reason or the other, they left the church. They went elsewhere. It was a matter of time. Their commitment went down. Their loyalty to God went down. Their devotion went down. Their prayer life went down. Their readiness for the soon coming of the Lord went down. And before they knew it, they became like lords that went away from Abraham. Lord for God, that he knew the God of heaven through Abraham. Lord for God, that everything that he knew about righteousness was through Abraham. But Lord, allow the mundane things of life, the temporary things of this world, to take his love, his attention, his commitment, his devotion, his loyalty from his master and uncle, Abraham. And then he went away. He saw the part of town that looked good, well watered. And then he went and settled there. Play, pay attention. It's not all that glitters that's a gold. It's a matter of time. I pray your labor in the faith will not be in vain. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought a good fight. A good fight. Somebody may be fighting wrongly. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. This was at the end of the journey of Paul. He looked back. Look at me here. When Paul began the journey of faith, with commitment, with devotion, with dedication, with consecration, he burned the bridge behind him. And then he got to a point. He looked back and he saw all the things that he left behind. And he said, all things were lost. And then... He continued the journey. Just like when you are in a flight, in an aeroplane. When the plane take off, and pay attention, the plane of your life will take off. The plane of your life will not crash. When the plane take off, initially when you are on the tarmac, you see everything around as they are but then the plane takes off and begin to go off ascending 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 i pray you continue to go up higher and higher and higher in jesus name when you look through the window you still be seeing the houses the cars and everything but the higher you go the smaller they are becoming am i right and so, when Paul looked, those things were not so much of value anymore. But then, when the plane gets to a higher altitude, 22,000 feet high, 35,000 high, when you look back, do you see anything below? You see nothing. I pray that God will take your eyes, your affection, and your attention away completely from the things of this world in Jesus' name. Amen. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Paul gets to a point in life, he look at those things. Initially he said, they were lost. They were lost. But now at this point of his work with the Lord, at this point of his commitment to the Lord, consecration to the Lord. He looked back to those things and he said they were dumbs. They were unprofitable. No more alone. They stink. They were useless. It was like, how on earth did I ever got into this? I pray that God will get you to that point in your life 
that the things of this world will mean nothing to you in Jesus' name. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. You will finish well. I have kept the faith. Yes, opposition, persecution, tribulation, everything, in spite of it all. He said, I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Sickness will come. In fact, infirmity will come. Bereavement will come. I have kept the faith. It's a henceforth. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. That is a man who had a vision. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is a man that endureth temptation. You will endure. Temptation to go back to the world. Temptation to commit sin. Temptation to lie. Temptation to go and put on the things of the world. Do you know there are some of you, let me talk to you as a father, talk to all the children. Before you came to Christ, you knew how you used to dress. And you knew the people you were pleasing with your dressing. With all those jewelry. With all those makeup. With all those eyelids with all those bangles, with all the necklaces, with all the chest open dresses, and the back open dresses, and the mini skirts, and the shorts that you wear as a man, and the way you open your chest, and the kind of hairstyle you caught as a man, and the way you walk, I can tell you, you say, Pastor, how do you know I've been there, I came out of it, and I'm not going back there. As a young man, we know how, how we walk. Eh? As he, as, you, you know what I'm talking about? Amen? And when you see the ladies, your, 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 your stepping changes. You know how you, you iron your, your pants and the gator? Amen? We knew why we were doing those things. We knew they were not for God's glory. We knew we were trying to get attention, draw attention to ourselves. We knew we were targeting somebody. Now that you came to Christ, that is why before I came to deeper life, after I gave my life to Christ, the Spirit of the Lord made me to know, you know, you know, you know. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I pity people that says that is deeper life doctrine. Thank God. I knew them before I came to deeper life. Amen. Amen. I people that says that is your church. It's not about our church. If as far back as the book of Genesis, Jacob could look at the family and tell them to submit and surrender the idol and the earrings, and destroyed everything. If as far back as in the book of Exodus, Aaron could tell the Israelites, bring your jewelries, and then he made, he made a molten car from out of it. Those things that you are still keeping in your vanity boxes, they have become an idol to you. The Lord wants me to tell somebody, destroy that idol. You go home today, you get rid of them. Because the opportunity will always come for you to wear those things, but when you don't have them anymore. Yes, initially to be like a loss to you. All those dresses that does not honor and glorify God. You go home and you put them off. Off. Off from your way, from your life, from your closets. If it means you remaining with only one cloth, the Lord will take care of you. The Lord will take care of you. He that strives for mastery, running in the race, run all. Run all. 
Run all. It's not just about coming to church. Run all. It's not just about praying when we say pray. Run all. Righteousness in the morning, righteousness at noon, righteousness in the middle of the night. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. May I tell you this? You may see a tree with a lot of leaves on it. Jesus is not looking for leaves. He's looking for fruits. Bring ye forth fruit meat for repentance. God is not looking for leaves. I have this degree. I have this position. I have this title. All those are leaves. He's looking for fruit. You will bear fruit. I said you will bear fruit. And that's why when Jesus saw the multitude in Matthew chapter 5, he went out onto a mountain, set himself down to teach them the way of the Lord, the way of the cross. You know, there is a song we sing the way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. Yes, it's a way of shame. It's a way of ridicule. It's a way of rejection. It's a way of abandonment. It's a way of isolation. But that is the way that leads home. Don't you know the Bible says? There are two ways. One is broad and straight. And there are many people going through it, the way of religion. But then there is another one that is narrow, narrow, narrow. Somebody say narrow. Somebody say narrow. You will walk on the narrow way. I say you will walk on the narrow way. It leads to heaven. The Bible says, very few are the people going through that way. So, I submit to you, if you want the way of the populace, the way of the majority, the religion of the masses, you will end up in hellfire. That preacher is doing this. That pastor is doing that. That evangelist is doing that. They are not the word of God. They are not the principles of God. They are not the precepts of God. Thy law have I hid, thy word have I hid in my heart. That I might not sin against you. That I might not sin, that I might not sin. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Bind the word of God on the tables of your hearts. Let it be the guide of your life in Jesus' name. I look at three points. I have been wetting the ground for you. Amen. Number one, learning from the exceptional preacher and teacher. If you want to really strive for mastery, you have to learn from the master. From the Savior, Jesus Christ. Come quickly to that Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. Pay attention here. You want to make it to heaven? You will not only come to church, you come to church on time. If you are a real disciple, a follower of Christ, you go to work, don't you? Your children go to school, don't they? If not for coronavirus, if they miss the school bus, the school bus will not wait for them, will they? If they don't get to school on time, the teacher will not say, because this person has not come, we are going to wait. Do they wait? Ah, uh ah. -uh. Why are we treating God as if he's powerless? Why don't you get serious with our lives? 
Let me tell you what I do. If I'm going for appointment and I'm running late, for whatever reason, I don't like going late, I'm fine. But if I'm coming to church, somebody say coming to church, and for whatsoever reason I'm running late, I take getting to church more important than police stopping me on the road. Are you with me? My goal is to always get to this church 7.30. Not because if I don't come until 8.30, nobody is going to arrest me. I am the boss here. Amen? Nobody is going to say this. But I feel if I must take anything serious, I must take serious the work of God, the house of God, the people of God. And you can do it. And do I tell you this? I'm not the only one. There are people here doing exactly the same. It's like we, we, are, we never spoke together. But I just see if I don't get there, get here before them, they get here before me. Why not you? And some of these people, for me, I don't have any child that is that young anymore. Amen? My kids are all grown. The, 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 the least of them, the last of them, rather, is taller than me now. Amen? But where I'm going is this. Some of these people have little children that they have to wake up and bathe and dress up and wake up on time and they come on time. If they can make it, why not me? Brother, sister, the Lord will wake you up. The Lord will steer you up. You can't blame it. Eh, it's because of these children. It's because of you. Even if the kids are not there, you will still come late. Lift up your right hand. And say, by the grace of God, with the help of God, in the name of the Lord, I promise the Lord to take him serious and come to church on time. Amen. But beyond coming to church, Let's say like live. Beyond coming to church. You want to live the God kind of life. And gladden the heart of the Lord. You learn from the master. Learning from the exceptional preacher and teacher. Jesus knew people needed to be taught. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Because I love you. Amen. You know what I want to say? I want to see people that are, that, that are doing well, that I can even say, oh, Lord, uh, there is something about this brother. There is something about this sister. Give me the grace. Amen? I want to also learn from you. So when I challenge you, you challenge me. We challenge one another, and then we are all flying high. Amen? Like eagle. In the face to God's glory. Not rising and falling. Not competing with people that are going nowhere. I will not compete with people going nowhere. You learn from the master. Look at the way Jesus lived his life all through and through. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 12. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gate, that they may hear. And that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of his law. Gather them together. Your children, your neighbor, your parents, your relative, your colleague, Gather them together to come and hear the word of the Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Look up here. Amen. You know, sometimes I tell you things not to boast or to brag, 
because myself, I'm, I'm still praying on daily basis for God to give me the grace to run to the end. It's not how you started that matter, but how you ended. I'm only sharing the past with you to help and to encourage you. My goal is not on the back. My goal is in the front. It's ahead. I'm looking at that heaven. And I will make it to that heaven. And you will make it to that heaven. But this is where I'm going. When I gave my life to Christ, because of the way it happened, it happened in an office environment, not in any church. I was invited for a program, Break Time Fellowship. And I felt, oh, that will help me because I was already a minister, you see? Somebody who is not born again. A dead man ministering to dead people. The Lord will deliver you. And so, I honored that invitation because I felt it would help me to know how to preach better. I didn't know about the way of salvation. I was reading the Bible that I was not living. I wasn't living the life. But I got to that meeting. And the Lord arrested me. And I gave my life to Christ. The very day I gave my life to Christ, my colleagues at work, they knew something happened. Not because I told them a word, because at that time, I didn't even know what happened was called being born again. But I suddenly realized that I couldn't joke anymore, I couldn't jest anymore, I couldn't do rubbish things all of a sudden. And my friends would poke joke to me, and I was a changed person. You will be changed. few months later with the help of God I'm talking about you gathering your people together in that same office where they had known me with my life and everything now that my life has changed you know what I did I started a Christian fellowship in that office amen and both my colleagues and my supervisors and managers became members of that fellowship. And it was later, later, one of them that finally came to the fellowship happened to be a member of Deep Alliance. It was him, I still remember the name as I talk now, that now told me about Deep Alliance Bible Church. Then, after much persuasion, I decided to go and give it a trial. The day I got there, it was just Bible study then, not a full fledged church. The day I got there, I heard the word of God. I heard the word of God. And I said to myself, if these people are fools, today I join the fools. And to God's glory, this year will make it 40 years since I have been part of the fool. 40 years. And yet, it's still just like yesterday to me. I have a goal before me. Like I gather them together. Some of the people today are leaders that I gather together there. The leader scene is a leading scene. But since the way I led them was the right way, some of them left their worldly churches and then they also came to deeper life. Today they are leaders in this church. Leaders in this church. Let others see Jesus in you. Amen? Let others see Jesus in you. Some people don't understand why sometimes they see me playing, joking, smiling, at another time they see me frowning. When all is well, I can even roll on the floor with you. But, you want to take the glory of God and the grace of God for granted, you will see a different person in me. And it doesn't matter how close you may be to me. It doesn't matter. Jesus, that's what I'm saying, learn from Jesus. The mother and the brethren, brothers and sisters, they came. 
to distract him while he was busy ministering to souls. And they were all at the back. And then they got the other people there. Can you help us to tell him? And they said, your mother and your brethren. He looked at them. He said, who is my mother? And who are my brethren? I don't know them. My mother and my brethren are these people that are seated here listening to the word of God. If you are still closer to anybody out there more than people in the faith, you are not running the race lawfully. Amen? Amen? I pity some of us that don't know what this Christian race is all about. All about. This morning I was reading about Elijah meeting Elisha and throwing his mantle on Elisha and walking away and Elisha understood. And Elisha knew the call of God has come upon my life. Let me go say bye-bye to my parents. And Elisha right away, all the oxen, the sheep that he was shepherding, you know what he did? He slaughtered them all. He slaughtered everything, distributed everything out. And then he followed Elijah. He followed Elijah. Until you lay all on the altar, you will not be able to follow the Lord to the end. Lay all on the altar, my sister, my brother. Lay all on the altar. Learn from the Savior. John chapter 3 verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. You see, that is Nicodemus saying you are a teacher come from God. No other person can teach you better than Jesus. Learn from him. Learn from him. Philippians chapter 4 verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Learn from him. Second point. Living by God's eternal precepts. You learn when you learn, then you live the life. You live by God's eternal precepts. When I use the word precepts, I mean God's principles, God's rules and regulations, God's teachings, instructions, and guidelines. You live by those eternal, eternal. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but not a judge or teacher of the word of God will pass and fulfill live by those things. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, through to 27. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, the blessing is not in the hearing, but in the blessing. Uh, uh, sorry, it's not, uh, the blessing is not in the hearing alone, but in the doing of it that brings blessing. He said, I would like him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the flocks came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of man, and doeth them not, and disobeyed them, and ignored them, and overlooked them, shall be likened unto a foolish man. You will not be foolish. Which built his house upon a sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall. This is it. Whether you are real or you are not real, the rain will fall. The wind will blow. And upon that which you have built, the flood will came. If you are real, everything will stand. Persecution, opposition, death, bereavement, um, 
uh, joblessness, sickness, infirmity, all those are part of the packages of life. When those things come, that's when we know who you are. I want to remind you again that God is looking for fruits and not leaves. And not leaves. Let's look at some of the fruitless people or distinguishing characters of fruitless Christians. You will not be one of them. Number one is laziness. They are lazy. Spiritually lazy, physically lazy. They procrastinate. They are excuse givers. They are selfish. They talk big without any action to back it up. Have you not seen people, when you have a meeting, they can give ideas and suggestions, but they will never lift a finger to get anything done. You don't want people like that in your meeting. But you want people that will say, people like Jacob, that say, God has given it unto us. What are we waiting for? Let us go. You need men and women like that. Amen? They discourage others. They are discouragers. They are discouragers. They are the ones that are always late to meeting. They don't want any standard. They are always complaining. Hey, why is this? Hey, why is that? Complainers. They are proud. They are proud. They are too big to serve. They are disloyal. They are self-seeking. They are contentious. They create problem within the... Ah, look up here. Sister Jane, have you heard it? Brother Julius, ah, you have not heard. Where is your ear? The Lord will deliver you in Jesus' name. They divide the church. They scatter fellowship. Have you not seen people? They get here problem. They get here problem. They get here problem. 1996, I left New York for Atlanta, Georgia to pastor the church over there. And as a new pastor, there were some issues in the church. And then when people come and say, this has been going on, pastor, and then while I'm looking into it, then there is this particular sister that the name will come up. And then we settle that one, and then another group. In the midst of it, the name of the same sister will come up. And then another time, and then I say, something must be wrong with this person. Something must be wrong. The Lord will deliver you in Jesus' name. Amen. They are contentious. They are hostile to the truth. When you preach the word of God, they will look for loopholes in it. Hey, why is he preaching like that? Why is he preaching as if we are all sinners? If you are a sinner, tell us you are a sinner. Amen. They are compromisers. They compromise the truth. They are like jellyfish. They, can't, they have no backbone to stand for anything. They are on equal yoke. They are unstable. They are lukewarm. They do eye service. They are rebellious. They are stubborn. They get into self-glory. They are unfaithful in service. They are unfaithful in tithing. They don't pay their tithe. They are unfaithful in timing. They don't keep to time in anything. They are unfaithful in talent. They don't use their talent for God's glory. They are critical and judgmental. They are immoral. They are unethical. Immoral. They can talk so nice, but wait for them, watch them. Catch them in a corner. You see what they are watching, pornography. You see what they are doing on their job, messing with another lady, messing with another man. You see all the mini, mini they are putting on. You see their language, dirty language. The Bible tells us in the book of Jude, chapter 1. Jude, chapter 1. It has only one chapter, but Jude is the book before Revelation. He says, Jude, I like Jude. I like Jude. Fair, focused, faithful, fruitful, 
fulfilling. He was able to call a spade a spade. Listen to me, brothers and sisters, you should be able to call a spade a spade if you're really living for God. So, look at it. Are you there now? If you're there, just say amen. amen. Jude chapter 1, from verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God, the Father, to them that are sanctified, sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called, verse 2, mercy unto you, and peace, and love be multiplied. Beloved, look at verse 3. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you, and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in on our way, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people after the land of Egypt, afterward, what did he do? Destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first essay, but left their own habitation, he had reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh as set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh despise dominion and speak evil of dignitaries you see people they don't care. They can talk to leaders anyhow. They can be rude anyhow. And when they see people that are respecting the leader, ah, why are you treating him like God? They forgot the Bible says you give honor. To whom honor is due. And that leadership is not by age. It's not by title. It's not by connection. It is by grace. When you abuse the grace, you'll be disgraced. Are we together? No man can be put in place of God. And that's why the Bible is telling us here that these people are filled with dreamers. They defy the flesh. They despise dominion. They despise authority and speak evil of dignitaries. Verse 9. Yet, now it's giving us comparison. That, look up here. He says, as bad as Satan is, as terrible as the devil is, that nobody wants to have anything to do with the devil. When Michael the archangel was contending with Satan, he didn't raise up any negative thing against Satan. He wasn't abusing Satan. He rather rebuked him in the name of the Lord. Look at that verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation. Tell somebody, watch your mouth. Be careful. Michael did not bring up a railing accusation against Satan, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. Verse 10. But these, that is, these unbelievers, these inconsistent people, carnal people, worldly people, churchious people, religious but not righteous people, verse 10, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. When the leader take a decision, make a decision, take a stand, they don't know the detail. They start running their mouth. It's like somebody. We're coming back to this. They were to wed. And then the wedding was canceled. 
just recently. And they went on the air. And you know the bloggers in that country, they began to blog and everything. But eventually, generally the church will not talk. But because of the way it was going, the church now spoke out. Only to realize that these people had been involved with immorality. They disciplined them. And afterwards, the church forgave them. And before the, real, before the wedding again, another thing happened. So the bloggers now began to descend on them. Like, if you know that you don't want to live the holy life that deeper life preaches, what are you doing there? Amen? You know this church, and we know what the church stands for. We know ourselves, and we know our category. But you choose to go there. And now you are mad that the discipline is because of committing sin. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Come back to that verse 10 again. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. It will not be woe unto you. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Bela for reward and perish in the gainsaying of Corey. These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit we direct, without fruit, twice dead, plugged up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, forming out their own shame, wandering stars. To whom is reserved? Tell me what is reserved for them. The blackness of darkness forever. Verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's